Hey everyone, welcome to NX Comp. Hey Victor, are you there? Hi everyone, and welcome to NX Comp. I'm Jeff Cross, co-founder of Narwhal, the company behind NX. I'm Victor, I'm a co-founder of Narwhal, and I'm an NX and NX Cloud architect. We're so excited to kick off the first ever NX Comp today. <laughs> NX is four years old, and today we want to celebrate how far NX has come in four years. We're not going to spend too much time looking back, but we are going to take a look back at how far NX has come, uh, what NX looks like today, and how it's still evolving. And let's start with NX Evolution. That's my pig cheddar. We announced NX, the first release, at a conference called Angular Mix uh, in 2017 in October. And originally, it was a tool for uh, managing large code bases with large teams with multiple Angular applications, or monorepos is another way of, of uh, putting the focus. Uh, but since then, it's come a long way. Uh, from being an original tool for monorepo tools for Angular apps, it's now an extensible build framework. And the secret to NX's success is that we don't build it based on secondhand guesses of what our users need. We actually build it from the pain that we ourselves experience by working alongside our enterprise clients to build applications. Which explains why 48% of the Fortune 100 companies are using NX. We wanna look a little bit at some other metrics of note uh, with some caveats that uh, we're not trying to brag about how amazing NX is. Uh, we're trying to make it clear that uh, NX is a solid tool with a thriving community, and you should feel safe betting on NX. Uh, if we get any credit, it's that we, we started NX and we maintained the core of it, uh, but the growth really has been because of the community around NX, people contributing to it, people building plugins for it, and people using NX. Another caveat is that measuring open source is hard. Anyone can download NX and we don't have to know about it. So we have to look at some, some of our internal data as well as some externally available data to try to paint a picture of how NX is growing, what, what that growth looks like, who's using it. And we'll share some of that in, in these slides. So fortunately, there, there are a few indicators we look at to understand how NX is growing. One thing we measure is traffic to the NX docs on nx.dev. Now, in, uh, in this chart, you can see that in J June, we had 57,000 unique users. It was actually more than that in July and August. A lot of that was from traffic for the conference. So we, we stopped it at June uh, to try to be honest about, uh, about how much traffic we, we receive normally. And that's great growth. We want to see that up and to the right. Uh, we also, we don't want people to have to visit our docs too much. So uh, we want NX to be intuitive. So we don't try to improve this number. It's just a number we look at uh, in terms of seeing a trend. And another metric we look at is monthly NPM installs. And this is another thing that everyone installs their dependencies differently. Some people use Artifactory or things like that that will cache dependencies and not install them all the time. So we don't look at this as a way of saying, these are how many people are using NX. We mostly look at it in terms of trends to see growth. And as you can see, uh, NX has grown quite, quite nicely. And the past month, uh, or in August, it was installed more than 2.4 million times, which is almost a four times increase since last August. So in one year, we've, we've increased the downloads four times. In 2019, we focused on adding more ways for NX to make it easier to get lightning fast builds locally and in CI. NX is already good at determining what projects were affected by a change and rerunning only the tasks that needed to be rerun, which saves a lot of time. We introduced a mechanism called computation caching. So you could record task outputs locally and intelligently decide when you could replay those, those uh, tasks outputs without actually having to run the task again. So saving potentially many minutes or, or tens of minutes on certain tasks, uh, which combined makes a, makes a big difference to the amount of time spent running builds and tests. Uh, this had a huge impact on build times for the teams we were working with. But while computation caching made a significant difference in each independent environment, we knew we could significantly increase the frequency of cache hits if we connected the CI environment and every developer computer to a shared cache. 
And so we created NX Cloud and launched it in April of last year, 2020. It's a SaaS product, but it's got free tools so that any team can use it and take advantage of these things, even if they're not paying for, for the product. And we're happy to say that because of the free utilities and the, the things we've done to make it easier for teams to adopt it and to subscribe to NX Cloud, uh, we've seen quite a, a tremendous growth uh, since last September. So we had 3K connected workspaces then, and now we're up to 24K. Some of these are paid, some of these are not paid, and uh, but we like to see that our goal is to have NX Cloud make sense for every workspace. Uh, we're happy to see so many workspaces taking advantage of it. I'm not going to go into too much detail on NX Cloud, but Kirill's from Narwhal is going to give a talk on Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, where he's going to go over all the cool features, all the stuff you can use to make your life easier by using NX Cloud as part of your workflow. The success of NX is credited to the developers using NX, as well as the developers contributing to making the NX ecosystem thrive. And this starts with the NX core team. And the NX core team at Narwhal has grown so much in the past few years, we can't even fit them in one slide. Unless we make them really tiny, and then we can fit them. Uh, but we're pretty proud of the team that we've put together. Um, but uh, they're only one part of the picture. Uh, it takes lots of people to make the best framework on the market. And uh, in fact, we have on the NX repo itself, we have over 176 contributors as of today. We want to say thank you to everyone who submitted code, uh, created an issue, or helped make the NX docs a little bit better. And you can show your support by giving it a star on GitHub. Go ahead, do it right now. I'll wait. Okay. And of course, we couldn't call NX a build framework if it wasn't extensible. Uh, in the past couple of years, the NX core team has spent a lot of effort to make the plugin system more powerful so that the community could build great plugins, the same as the first class plugins that we build. And the community has definitely stepped up and, and uh, made some amazing plugins, over 40 different plugins for different frameworks and even different languages. You can see the pl community plugins at nx.dev slash community. And now I'm going to pass the baton to my BFF, Victor Safkin, who's going to show what NX is today and what it means to call NX a build framework. Today I want to tell you what we mean when we say that NX is a build framework. And to do that, first I'm going to define some common goals most organizations and teams share in regards to dev tooling, right? And then I'm going to talk about NX, its core plugins, integrations, and finally I'm going to tie it all together so hopefully it all makes sense. So what is build framework, right? Let's look at those common goals, right? Some of them are centered around technology. Uh, things like uh, teams want their dev setup or their build system to be fast and generate uh, no waste, right? If you uh, don't have to do something, uh, you're like, you already know that the result is successful, don't do it. Uh, they want the system to be stable, right? No flaky tests, things like that. Uh, they want to be able to integrate different technologies, right? Uh, tools, languages, frameworks, things like that again. And again, it's not as easy just putting it all together. Uh, the harder part is staying up to date with them, like evolving your system as those technologies change and they change at different rates. And those teams don't talk to each other all the time, right? So uh, it's actually a harder problem than it seems. Uh, there are also like team-centric, org-centric goals, you know, like consistency, best practices. You want to make sure your application looks similar, right? Different parts of your application that you follow best practices, you know, the best practice of your community or your organization. You can create new artifacts uh, with relative ease. You can refactor things. And here I don't mean renaming a field or whatever, right? I, what I mean is you have the old version of the API and you have a new version of the API and you want to transition your system or systems from the old one to the new one gradually without breaking anything, right? that type of refactoring. And of course you want to enable dev mobility and collaboration, right? As a developer, I should be able to you know, move from one part of the project to another one and feel right at home, right? Know where things live, what I can run, how I can run it, etc. And also as a backend and say engineer and a designer, right? I should be able to work together and feel again that I sort of can communicate uh, with each other, we can communicate with each other more effectively, right? That we talk about the same thing. So some of those goals uh, are 
more important for the greenfield projects, smaller teams and startups. Some of them are more important for larger systems and enterprises, but they all matter to everyone, right? Uh, just a, to a different degree. Right? That is why the whole point about separating startups and enterprises, I think it's bogus, right? Most teams kind of desire the same thing, is just, you know, uh, the priorities can differ a little bit. What's interesting is that all of those goals uh, aren't just for like build tools, right? Uh, these are goals for all dev tools. Right? And VS Code, for example, is a good answer for them, right? In the editor IDE space, right? VS Code scales with the size of your projects, it remains fast, it provides plugins for different technologies, enables integration, gives you refactoring capabilities. Developer can switch different machines and get a consistent dev experience or relatively consistent dev experience. They can go from one project to another one and still understand what's going on. Front-end and back-end engineers can work together, right? Using the same tools, right? And, you know, uh, in, which increases collaboration, they can feel productive. Right, so what's important in here is that VS Code gives you all of that uh, with this architecture. They give you a small and simple core but most of what you get from it, you get sort of via plugins. So you take a bunch of plugins, you compose them, right? You install them, you configure them, and that is your custom editor experience. Many of those plugins come pre-installed, but they're still plugins. It's important to realize that, right? So uh, you can assemble a fairly custom editor experience as VS Code without having to script anything, right? Uh, it's not hard to assemble a custom editor experience. Like if you are Lisp, uh, like an Emacs user and you use Elisp or uh, a Veeam user and these days you use uh, Lua, uh, you can author a lot of custom stuff and just have a, a very unique editor experience that only you have, but not a lot of people do that, right? Because there are downsides. It's costly to maintain this, right? You don't want to like architect your editor experience in addition to architecting your system, right? So our next is like the VS Code of build tools, right? VS Code actually is the main inspiration for Annex in many ways because we share the same philosophy, right? So Annex to build tools is like VS Code to editors, right? When we talk about build framework, this is what we mean, right? We mean not, we don't mean Angular or Ruby on Rails or anything like that. There is no library versus framework, anything going on here, right? A build framework is simply a set of building blocks you can use to create your custom dev build setup right, that meets your needs and the needs of your organization, but at the same time, it's done in a way where you don't have to architect your whole build dev experience from scratch, right? So in the way you take VS Code plugins and settings, and you can assemble your editor experience, that's what Annex is trying to do in the sort of build space, right? Right degree of customizability and easy to use. So let's see what I mean, right? What components does Annex give you so you can achieve that? So there are three main blocks uh, that or sections of Annex that I want to talk about. There is Annex core, there are plugins, and there are integrations. So the core part is the CLI with all its core capabilities. Let me cover some of them, right? Or some of the ones that are worth talking about. Workspace analysis is a big deal, right? Annex knows how your projects uh, relate to each other, what depends on what, without you having to tell it. No bogus package to JSON files, etc. right? The most tools, to be clear, analyze your workspaces. They just look at package to JSONs, which is not enough, right? Annex can look at a lot more and do it more efficiently, right? Faster. And as a result, the graph, the project graph it gives you is more granular it's actually more representative of the actual dependencies, right? And it works with other technologies as well, right? Because like Java and Go, where obviously you don't have package JSON files. Next, Annex is able to run your task, and it can do it such that it never builds, tests, or lins the same thing twice. It works across machines, CI or dev machines, right? Meaning that if the CI uh, machine computed something, I can just get the result of that computation uh, locally, super fast, uh, and it, uh, it, it's sort of, sort of hard to describe it, right, without showing, 
but it, we attend to a lot of small details, many other tools don't attend to. For example, correctly replaying STD out in particular on Windows. Right? Uh, we are able to show you when we retrieve startup from cache uh, the STD out that looks exactly as it looked the first time. Right? It's much harder than it seems. Okay. Um, next, Annex supports code generation. Uh, you can create new artifacts, like, you know, libraries, you know, components, etc. And uh, that's not that challenging. It also supports code augmentation, which enables large scary fact tags, right? That's what I talked about before, right? To make it uh, work well, Annex comes with a virtual file system that allows you to write uh, very, very powerful code, like uh, source file transformers. And I'm going to show you some of that later on. Uh, it works with previews, with dry runs, it's integrated into editors. It's much more powerful than what we see normally, right, in, in systems that support code generation. Annex supports distribute task execution, which means that Annex can uh, take a command, any command, and run it across multiple machines, but providing the dev ergonomics uh, over running it on a single machine. So dependencies between tasks are respected, you know, it's all work, working fine. Uh, if you run a command, and I can just take that command, run it on 20 machines, and those machines will share files, will do whatever is needed to make sure the command succeeds, right? Uh, but the result for you as a developer is one machine where you see all the files and all terminal output as if it ran on one machine. So perfect dev ergonomics, but super fast. Uh, I'm not aware of any JavaScript tools that can do that, right? There are heavy duty tools like Bezu, so that built to do that, built by Google. They're hard to use, so no one in the JS space uses them, uh, but it's a huge enabler, right? It's, uh, once you have that, uh, you can scale your workspace to a much larger degree, right? And the more things we see uh, other tools offer is a like basic sharding, right? You will split 100 tests into three buckets, you run three machines, and that stops working very quickly, okay? Finally, Annex is able to look at the code change uh, introduced, for example, the pull request, and it, fig it can figure out uh, what might be affected uh, by this change, right? Uh, what projects might be broken, etc., such that you can only test or build uh, that section of the workspace instead of redoing everything, right? So uh, now let me show you how to use Annex Core so you can see it in practice. All right, let's create a new Annex workspace using the NPM preset. And the presets are sort of analogous to plugin bundles. Uh, let's have a quick look at package.json. As you can see, there is not much here, just a few packages that we need to have to run uh, the CLI. I can generate a new project, and here I'm using the NPM package generator because uh, it's the simplest thing I can use to create a new thing, right? I can see the preview of what would be generated at the bottom. Now let's look at the created project. It has a package.json file with a test script, right? And the script runs index.js file that just prints hello world. If I run it, I will see hello world. And if we run it again, uh, the terminal output will be retrieved from cache, All right? That's it. We can run any NPM script via NX and get the computation caching for free. And we didn't have to configure anything, right? it just works. Let's add two more projects, uh, B and C, and let's see import A and B, okay? If I run next depth graph, uh, I will see that the relationship between A, B, and C is known to Annex. Right? And if we check our uh, changes in and make a change to A, we will see that Annex knows that A and C might be affected by this change and B just cannot be, right? Again, we didn't have to do anything, but the affected logic works, right? Annex knows how projects relate without us having to do anything, for instance, without us having to create a dependency in some package.json file, right? So how much configuration did we generate to make it work? Hey, let's take a look. So Annex.json configures this CLI, the whole Annex system, right? And it would, it would be the same even if we had a thousand projects. So it's a fairly small file. And workspace.json simply leaves the projects. Next, let's talk about plugins. So plugins can customize some aspects of the core, like workspace analysis, 
task running, artifact storing, caching, right? All of those can be changed by the plugins. Plugins can also depend on each other. And that's an important property, right? If you want to get consistency and reuse, you have to have it. And to have that, the plugin APIs have to build such that they're composable. And that's what we did, and you will see it in a second, right? So many aspects of the core, plugins can customize. Uh, there are two big parts of what plugins offer that most folks see right away, right? One of them is generators. Plugin can offer generators, but it's important to know that it's also optional. You don't have to use plugin generators. You can create files from scratch. You can use your own thing of generating things. That is fine, right? Not a big deal. Uh, the rest of Annex doesn't care. Plugins can add files, like new projects, new pages, etc. They can change existing files, right? You can, for example, uh, add a new page and perhaps change some router configuration cyber to match that, right? Uh, that's an important thing. Uh, it's hard to do because if you want to do this well, you have to transform ASTs and do you know fairly sophisticated stuff. Uh, Annex offers validations, defaults, etc. So when you look at generator, it's a, a toolable and rich dev experience. Uh, they are dry runnable, meaning that uh, Annex comes with a virtual file system, so you can pretend you're running a generator to see what would happen, right, without actually changing your file system. And finally, uh, there is an editor integration. So you can right-click in VS Code and create things using a fairly nice uh, metadata-driven UI. Let's look at an example. Let's generate a generator. Let's see what we got. The schema the JSON file describes the inputs of the generator. And the next CLI can transform, normalize, and validate the inputs based on this schema. And the VS Code integration, for example, uh, is driven by the schema as well. We also have a DTS file with the same schema. Right? And finally, the generator itself. This one is a bit too long because we, you know, uh, we generate a bunch of handy style that is useful for when you want to create a new or next plugin for your favorite technology, but it's not super useful for this particular presentation because it does too much. So I'm going to remove most of it. And instead, I'm going to do what most companies like to do, which is to wrap an existing generator. Right? It's very easy. A generator is just a simple JavaScript function that takes a file tree and a set of options, and it can modify this file tree and return side effect to the function. Right? The NPM package generator doesn't have any side effects, so I can just ignore the return value. Right? The real magic of Annex generators is not necessarily this piece. Right? This piece is very, very simple. It's the set of utilities Annex provides by Annex DevKit. Right? So Annex DevKit is a package you can import uh, that you can use to write your own generators. Right? And it has utilities for transforming TypeScript PSTs, filtering large file, file trees, etc. Right? So very many, very handy things that are easy to do with DevKit and actually quite hard to do if you start from scratch. Plugins can also offer custom executors. And once again, they are optional. Right? You don't have to use them. Right? If you have a next JS application, feel free to just invoke a bash script from within an X that you know, will build your next app. And the rest of an X, as, as I pointed out before, will work. So everything here is optional. However, it's very handy. So an executor is sort of like a, you know, a typed NPM script. Right? It can be used to express uh, long running tasks, which is uh, fairly, fairly challenging. Again, we, uh, we support validations, defaults to make sure your experience is uh, rich. They are toolable, you can ask questions about what you can invoke. And of course, they are integrated into your editor. Let's look at an example. Similar to a generator, an executor has a schema file, and it's again used by the CLI and by editors to provide rich dev experience. This one is empty, so it's not very interesting. An executor itself is just a function that takes options and optionally, take some context and then does stuff, right? This one just prints uh, some information to the console and returns success. Uh, but we can change it to, for example, invoking another executor, right? In general, composition is a big deal. For instance, implementing an end-to-end -end test target, watching for the app to be updated is trivial with executors 
and it's basically impossible with npm script. Finally, uh, plugins can offer migrations. And it's hard to overstress how important this is, but essentially the idea is that if you are familiar with database migrations, where you, you know, deploy a new version of the application and it detects that the database has to be adjusted to match the new version of the application, and it can do those adjustments before migrations, similar idea, but apply to the source code, right? You can say, hey, I would like to update from version 10 to version 12, update everything in my repo to make sure it works with version 12, okay? Let me show you how it works in practice. Here I have a workspace using an X 12.0. And as you can see, we have a Next.js application in this workspace and we use Next 10.1. If we run an X migrate latest, an X is going to fetch the information about all the plugins used, installed in this workspace and will do it recursively. By the end of this process, an X uh, will know what your package to JSON should look like, right, to have a consistent workspace and what you need to change in your source code to make sure your source code matches the new package to JSON, right? It will, of course, update our next configuration itself, right? But also everything regarding the tools you use, like Cypress, Storybook, right? Our next knows how those tools change, or those plugins for next, right? They know how those tools change. And the migrations for next are going to update your configs for those tools to make sure they keep working as you install new versions, right? This process is completed now, right? And as you can see, Annex has updated uh, the Annex itself, right? And the Next.js dependency has been bumped up to 11.1, right? We can now run migrations to update the source code to match our new package to JSON. As you can see, this is a small migration, so not much has, has happened, right? To keep our workspace working correctly. Right? And very often, this is everything we need to do. Annex updates your package to JSON and migrates your source code to match the package JSON. That's it. You do it in like, 10 minutes. Sometimes some migrations aren't fully automatic, right? Some changes cannot be done without a human making some decisions somewhere, right? An X will point those out, right? But it's still a huge improvement, right? Over reading some blog post about what needs to change and then Google Stack Overflow, etc. right? It's still much, much easier to be up to date with the tools you use when you use uh, an X migrate. The last part of an X is uh, it's powerful integrations like an xCloud, GitHub integration, VS Code, and WebStorm plugins, right? I would like to know that they all depend on an X core, not on uh, an X plugins, meaning that if you, regardless of what you have in your workspace, right, you can install a Vue plugin, a Rust plugin, build your own plugin, all uh, the integrations will work uh, perfectly right, without any hiccups. So the editor experience enriched by the plugins is uh, it's a very cool thing. We put a lot of effort in, right? You get other completion, you know, powerful uh, method that are driven UI. In general, a lot of assistance, especially for uh, larger workspaces, like refactoring, things like that. So please check it out. Our next cloud gives you distributed caching, distributed task execution, analytics. Uh, we are talking a lot about our next cloud at this event. So uh, please check out those talks. GitHub integration, is uh, the feature enabled via Next Cloud, uh, but it's fairly standalone. So if you just want to use this, right, uh, you can enable it and ignore the rest of Next Cloud. Right? It's a very handy thing. It allows you to see at a glance what has happened on your PR, right, in a way that is a lot more uh, uh, large workspaces friendly. Right? If you have to run tests against a thousand projects. Just looking at STD out is not is, is not going to uh, it's not going to be that useful. Okay, so now let's take a look at the goals I talk uh, talked about at the beginning. Right, some of them were tech oriented goals, some of them were team oriented goals. Right, and now let's see how our next feature, the building blocks I just talked about, help you provide good answers. Right, uh, for these goals. All right, so you use things like uh, distributed computation caching, distributed task execution affected to be fast. And you can be very fast. Uh, with those features, you can make sure your CI is under 15 minutes for a workspace of any size. All right, things like affected help you be stable, so you don't run things you don't have to run. Uh, plugins with code generators and executors can help you work, to, uh, different tools to work together and help you compose things, right? 
Migrations is an, a huge deal if you want to be up to date uh, with the technologies as they evolve. Again, generators, lean checks, uh, and I didn't talk about lean checks very much, but we offer a lot of cool things regarding them as well. Uh, helps you be consistent and follow best practices. Uh, migrations is a big deal as you refactor, right? Uh, I'm moving from an older version of API to a newer one. And finally, the discoverable CLI and editor integration is a big deal when it comes to dev mobility and collaboration. But I can go to any part of my project or to any project in the workspace and know what's going on and what I can run. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Victor's still talking. Uh, he'll probably go on for another few minutes. Hey, put Cheddar on. Oh, I gotta go. Uh, sorry about that. Ah, thank you, Victor. That was great. Um, all right, F to the final part of the presentation. I want to talk about something that's really interesting to, to us and really um, really a next step in our evolution as a company at Narwhal. Uh, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we're, we're always looking to make NX better. And one of the main ways we do that is by building applications with teams and building applications ourselves and seeing what the pain and what the challenges are of building modern applications. Uh, but we only get a small piece of the challenges that our customers actually face by working in that way. Uh, big corporations operate in a lot different way than we do. And we're a team of um, tens of engineers uh, compared with a lot of our customers who are working with hundreds of engineers, have their own complex policies to work with in own uh, enterprise security restrictions. And so we one of the things we've gotten really good at is listening to our customers and sending things out, seeing what sticks, seeing what, what uh, feedback they have, and figuring out how we can make NX better uh, f for them. Uh, so I want to talk about some of the things we've been learning from our, our customers, and I'm going to break that into three parts, and then I'm going to talk about what we're doing to address it. Uh, the three parts are Evergreen NX, Information Security, and Scaling NX. So firstly, we want NX to be an evergreen tool, and by that we mean we want teams to always be on the latest stable release. We want it to be basically free, like no no friction in the process of upgrading to the latest Annex core, as well as our first class plugins, and ideally community plugins as well. Uh, and that's why we, when we release Annex core, we rarely have breaking changes. We're really careful about making the process painless. And if plugins have breaking changes, that's what migration generators are for, to automate as much of that process as possible. And while most teams most of the time have a pretty easy process upgrading NX, uh, sometimes there are corner cases or other things, uh, your other priorities get in the way that make it where teams have, have a hard time keeping up with NX. And this is true with all dependencies. Sometimes it's hard to justify the effort to update dependencies very often. And so we've seen teams fall behind, maybe sometimes two to three major versions behind uh, if they get stuck on anything. So for teams, who want to stay evergreen and have the latest, greatest NX all the time, we've got something for you. But before we get that, let's talk a little bit about NX Cloud. So when we released NX Cloud last year, it the main thing it did was distributed caching, and it did that well. And that was the most impactful thing we could do at the time to make it where uh, teams can save lots of time just by sharing a cache. Uh, and as we released it, we got lots of feedback on things we needed to do to make NX Cloud more enterprise friendly. One was that we encrypted everything at rest over the network, everything's encrypted, but we didn't have end-to-end -end encryption to where you can encrypt it. So even we can't see your assets. We added that to NX Cloud, the, the public version, which is also available in NX Private Cloud. But team said they still wanted control over their their assets, so their the cache artifacts, the, the build artifacts. And so we introduced NX Private Cloud. And we did this in a way where you can you can run private cloud and you still get all the great things of NX Cloud. You've got the computation caching, you've got distributed task execution. These two things alone can save projects thousands of hours a month for large projects. But uh, And the built-in analytics are there. Uh, they show you the time saved by task so you can understand what's working, where the biggest opportunities for improving your build times are. And and one of the key things that, that uh, a lot of developers love now, which is which is one of the reasons NX Cloud has grown so much, is the run details view, where you can get uh, insights into each run, uh, each um, uh, like a, a pull request run or 
or uh, running a task locally, you can really dive into everything that's been that's going on in that and understand if why you have a cache miss or what failed and and really get to get to information quickly. Uh, we released NX Private Cloud. It's got all the same things as NX, NX Public Cloud, but you can run it on your own servers. The only thing we added was the ability for that to talk to our API externally so that you could manage billing and subscriptions for, for your own private cloud instance without having to go through a contract with us. You can still manage it the same as if you were on NX Cloud. But what we heard from our customers is even that is, isn't far enough. They need to be able to run NX Private Cloud in complete isolation without any outside network access. And, and we get it. That's a, that's a legitimate policy to have. Uh, you, want, you don't want to trust too much something, some tool that you're using from a third party. You want to be able to totally block access to outside the network and, and control, control it yourself. So we've got something for that as well. But I want to talk about one last thing, one final point before I talk about what we've got, and that's how to scale NX. We provide a lot of resources to help teams figure out how to do NX effectively, even with large teams and potentially hundreds of apps and libraries in a single workspace. But sometimes things can be difficult to figure out on your own. Like if we partitioned our libraries differently, could we have more cache hits? Or can we make it so less of our dependency graph is affected by common uh, projects that we're touching? Could we separate things in a different way so that we're not affecting everything when we touch certain libraries? Uh, could we do anything more to get the most out of NX's build optimizations? Are we really squeezing out every last drop of build performance so our team can move faster? So to address these unique needs of large organizations and complex workspaces, we're excited to announce a new subscription service from Narwhal called NX Enterprise. NX Enterprise is a subscription product designed to make the NX core team available to you to help get your workspace set up right and to stay evergreen. As NX evolves, we're just an email or video call away to help you get the latest, greatest improvements to NX core and official NX plugins. And with Enterprise, you can run NX Private Cloud in complete isolation inside your network and with a fixed annual subscription instead of utilization-based monthly expenses. So you have more predictable spend uh, and procurement teams love that. Everyone wants to be able to predict what you're going to spend. We'll work with you to come up with a subscription that makes sense for your team. And as we release new versions of NX Private Cloud, we're there to help you update it. We work alongside your team to update it so you're not scratching your head figuring out what kind of new configuration is required. Because Private Cloud, it's, you know, it's a self-managed thing. You need a little bit of support from the people working on it to, to make life easy. Narwhal's primary business for the past five years has been consulting and engineering, building apps alongside our clients. And these services are usually provided by having dedicated engineers working alongside client teams for an extended period of time, months or years. But now with an NX Enterprise subscription, Narwhal's NX experts can work with your team to make your workspace as fast and ergonomic as possible without needing to commit to large projects with dedicated engineers. If your builds break, Narwhal will help. If your builds end up taking longer than they should, Narwhal will help you figure out why. If you need help building NX plugins for your team, Narwhal will help you get it done. We've been working towards this model with several customers for some time now, and we're excited to formalize NX Enterprise into something we can offer to the NX community. This isn't a one-size-fits-all program. We work with each team to figure out what structure makes sense for them with the right mix of support, consulting, and uh, NX cloud licensing. NX Enterprise is available today, and we're gradually adding more clients to the program. Go to nx.app slash enterprise to learn more and to reach out to us to talk about what enterprise subscription might make sense for your team. With that, I want to thank you all for being part of our first ever NX conference. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much for your time and enjoy the conference.